Okay, listen closely. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we are healed. So where is this from? The Old Testament or the New Testament? Most Jewish people have been deceived by the rabbis and for that reason do not know who the Messiah is and the fact that the Messiah is come and gone. I have quite a number of Jewish friends and what they see concerning the Messiah is very appalling and sometimes I find it funny. I tend to give them two biblical chapters that speaks very well concerning the Messiah who he was and how he was manifested in the New Testament. But before I do that, let's watch this video by Dr. Michael Brown, where he distinguishes between who the Messiah was, his works, and how that he's come and gone. Let's watch. Now, when we talk about Jesus, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? It's important to know who we're talking about. And to do so, we have to unpeel a lot of the layers of church tradition. I have Jewish friends who grew up thinking that Jesus was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. So we, we want to dispel some rumors and misunderstandings. We're talking about Yeshua, who was called Christ because Christ is the Greek way of saying Messiah. His mother's name was Miriam. His followers were all Jews. <clears throat> Men like Yohanan, names like that, all right? And, and Yaakov, better known as James, and Yehuda, better known as, as Jude. You've heard of St. John the Baptist. He was actually Rabbi Yohanan the Immerser. So we're talking about a fellow Jew, the most influential Jew who ever lived, and asking the question, is he indeed the Messiah of Israel? Now, according to the scriptures, he came first for his own people. And we must look at what the scriptures say about that, but he also came for the nations. What's the role of the Messiah? What's he going to do? According to Moses Maimonides, the Rambam, writing in the 12th century, he laid out some of the key things that the Messiah, son of David, would do. He would turn the hearts of the Jewish people towards the Torah. He would regather the exiles. He would rebuild the temple. He would fight the wars of the Lord. He would ultimately establish God's kingdom on the earth. Now, I agree that the Messiah will do those things. The question is, is that all that the Messiah will do? What I'm going to present to you tonight is that Maimonides saw the second half of the mission but missed the first half of the mission. The only way a president can serve the second term of his presidency is if he first serves the first term. The only way a team can play the second game of a, of a, a second half of a game is if they first play the first half. I will show you that Jesus Yeshua must be our Messiah. He's the only one who can do the second part because he alone did the first part. What we need to do now is go on a journey through our Bible, through the Hebrew Scriptures, remembering that the Bible doesn't say the Messiah, son of David, will do this and do this. We have to look to see who the Messiah is, how he's described, and what he will do. So we start in Genesis, the 12th chapter, when God calls Abram, Abraham. He's going to bless him, bless his seed, and then through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And then, of course, God chooses Isaac, then Jacob, then out of the 12 tribes of Jacob, Judah. And in Genesis 49.10, it tells us that the rulership will come through Judah. This is ultimately now through David. And then it says the obedience of the nations, the obedience of the peoples will be his. So the Messiah is not just about Israel, but through Israel will bring light to the nations of the world. And in fact, we see in Isaiah 2, in, in the kingdom of God on the earth, that the, the peoples of the world will come streaming to Jerusalem. And we see in Isaiah 11, speaking about this son of David who will rule over an earth without war, that the nations will come to him. So let's keep this focus on the nations as we, we go into the book of Isaiah. And we see in Isaiah 42, it speaks of the servant of the Lord. Now, traditional Judaism will also say that servant is always Israel. Actually, there are Jewish traditions that recognize the servant in Isaiah, 2, uh, Isaiah 42 as referring not just to Israel, but as referring to the Messiah. In other words, there is a servant of the Lord within the nation who fulfills the mission of the nation. And if you'll study it carefully, don't just go by what you've heard. Do a careful study of Isaiah 40 to 55. You'll see when the servant is Israel as a nation, it's often joined together with Jacob, Jacob and Israel. And this servant is often deaf and unresponsive 
and languishing in exile because of its sins. The universal testimony of the Hebrew scriptures is that we were suffering in Babylonian exile because of our sins. Yet there's a servant within the nation who is righteous. And this servant, is, according to Isaiah 42, will be a light to the nations. Then when we get to Isaiah 49, the servant of the Lord speaks. Some Jewish tradition says this is the prophet speaking. It's clearly an individual. He's identified with Israel, but his mission is to Israel. And when you read Isaiah 49, this is what the servant says. Basically, I failed in my mission. I was called to regather the tribes of Israel, but I failed in my mission. And God says to him, no, no, no. This is a small thing for you. I have not only appointed you to restore Israel, but to be a light to the nations. So this servant of the Lord who fulfills Israel's mission, whose role is to regather the people of Israel, it seems as if he fails in his mission to Israel. But God says, no problem, you will be a light to the nations. And as we continue on reading about this servant, we see contrary to the servant Israel, which is suffering for its own sins. Isaiah 50 says you were sold because of your sins and iniquity. The whole testimony of the prophets is Israel is in exile because of his sins. The whole Torah law of blessing and cursing tells us that if our people were obedient, we'd be established in the land. If we were disobedient, we'd be scattered in exile. In contrast with the servant which suffers for its own sins, the Messiah, the servant within Israel, the one who seems to fail in his mission to Israel and becomes a light to the nations, he is not suffering for his sins, but for the sins of his own people. So when we get to Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse 13, what does it say according to the Targum, the ancient Jewish paraphrase? It recognizes that this speaks of the Messiah. And, and there's an ancient Jewish midrash, a midrash tan chuma, so, so a homiletical interpretation that was widely regarded in the ancient Jewish world and to this day. The Messiah will be high and lifted up and lofty exceedingly. What does it mean? He will be higher than Abraham. He will be more exalted than Moses. And he will be loftier than the angels. That's verse 13. But 52, 14 says, first, he's going to suffer terrible disfigurement. I mean, we're just painting a picture. I'm just looking at what the testimony of Scripture says. So this one who will be highly exalted, this one who will be rejected by his people, yet welcomed by the nations, before he is highly exalted, he will suffer terrible disfigurement and pain. And then as we get into Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, an amazing picture unfolds. That we, the Jewish people, thought he was suffering for his sins. What does it say? Surely he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. But what happens? We thought he was being smitten and suffering for his own sins. And then what is, what's the revelation that the nation gets? He was pierced for our transgressions. Crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace is upon him. And at the cost of his wounds, there's healing for us. Again, who is the prophet speaking of? And as we go on in Isaiah 53, we see that this one servant will die. He'll be cut off from the land of the living. It speaks of his burial, his death. He will die, and yet he will live on. Who is the prophet describing? Now, now we're often told that this passage speaks of the nation of Israel. Of course, it cannot be because Israel in exile was suffering for its own sins. Again, the universal testimony of the Hebrew scriptures to this effect, which we can demonstrate very easily with quote after quote after quote, including right in the surrounding section in Isaiah as well. But, but not only so, we are told that Isaiah 52, 13, here's what's going to happen. That the nations of the world will see Israel exalted at the end of the age and will be astonished because they'll think, Israel was suffering for its sins. Now we realize Israel was suffering for our sins. No, that's not the revelation. Ezekiel 39, this is it. And the nations shall know that the house of Israel were exiled only for their iniquity. This is what our prophets say. Because they trespassed against me so that I hid my face from them. The nations are not going to suddenly realize that the prophets were all wrong, though the words of the prophets will prove true. And when Israel was in exile and the nations of the world would overdo their punishment, 
What did the prophets say? And there are numerous verses that, that attest to this. The prophets of Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 30, that, that God would judge the nations where Israel was scattered. He would discipline Israel, but then he would destroy those nations. Israel's suffering in the nations didn't bring healing to ancient Babylon or healing to ancient Assyria. No, it brought the end of those empires. God judged them, whereas the Messiah's suffering brings healing to those that smote him, something radically and totally different. There's only one possible candidate, this one who seemed to fail in his mission to his own people, who was accepted as a light to the nations, who died for the sins of the nation where the nation thought he was dying for his own sins, and through his suffering has brought healing to multitudes, this one who died and yet lives on. It can only speak of one. What does it say in Psalm 118? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's the story of Yeshua, our Messiah. You say, here, you're missing the whole point, though. We're Jews, and we don't believe in human sacrifice. Well, of course. Of course we don't believe in human sacrifice. Christians don't believe in human sacrifice. The whole Bible repudiates the idea of human sacrifice. But Judaism believes in the atoning power of the death of the righteous. Well-known phrase in, 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 in Talmudic literature, mitatan shel tadikim, tichaper. The death of the righteous atones. So Rabbi Beryl Wine, respected Orthodox Jewish historian, he says this, he could refer to an old Jewish tradition dating back to biblical times that the death of the righteous and innocent served as an expiation for the sins of the nation or the world. The Zohar could explain Jewish mysticism with reference to Isaiah 53, that a righteous man is never afflicted save to bring healing to his generation and to make atonement for it. There's a chronicle of Jewish suffering, Yevon Mitzulah from the 17th century. It says, for since the day the holy temple was destroyed, the righteous are seized by death for the iniquities of the generation. There was a, a horrific slaughter, shocked the Jewish world in, in Harnof, neighborhood of Jerusalem a few years back, four religious Jewish men praying in the morning, rabbis killed by a Palestinian terrorist, bloody, horrific scene released for the world. There was a book that was released just a few weeks after that, and, and one of the rabbis in his eulogy, Rav Moshe Sternbuch, listen to what he said. Each of these four kedoshim, these holy men, who were killed is a korban olah, a burnt offering, and it is their blood that has stopped the midas hadin, the attribute of justice, from taking vengeance on all of Kal Yisrael, the people of Israel. In other words, God was angry with the nation, and these four righteous men who didn't deserve to die, their death thwarted uh, uh, warded off the wrath that was coming against them. This is a Jewish concept. That's what happened at the cross. It's not some foreign thing. It's not something just someone wears around their neck. It's not a crucifix hanging in a building somewhere. It was the perfectly righteous one taking the place of the sins of the world so that we, through repentance, repentance and faith, could receive forgiveness. Zechariah 6 there's a picture of a man called the branch, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33, identify this branch as a son of David. He is the Messiah. And in Zechariah 6, the one who stands as a representative of the branch, who is it? It's a man named Yehoshua, Yeshua, the high priest. He sits on a chair or a throne. He has a crown put on his head. It is a priest who serves as a representative of the coming branch, the Messiah. Why? Because the Messiah is a priestly king. What's interesting is that the Judaism of the Dead Sea Scrolls prior to the time of Jesus, it identified two messiahs, the messiahs of Aaron and Israel. They were looking for two different figures. Judaism developed the figures of Messiah, son of Joseph, and Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of Joseph, dying in the last great war, fighting for Israel, and then being raised up by the son of David, by the Messiah, son of David. And Rabbi Moshe Alshech, an influential Jewish homilist about 500 years ago, a Darshan, what does he say about Zechariah 12, 10? They'll look to me when they pierce. He said, that's talking about the Messiah, son of Joseph, who died as a perfect atonement for the nation. Sounds like a Christian gospel message. It's because the foundations of a Christian gospel message go back to the Hebrew scriptures and to a Jewish way of thinking. And, and here's what's so interesting. The Talmud even asked this question. And I'm not quoting the Talmud to say that Talmud believed in Jesus. No, the rabbis believe in Jesus. No. But the Talmud asked the question, this Messiah, this, this one that's coming, is he, is he coming in the clouds of heaven? Because that's what Daniel 7 says. 
or is he coming riding on a donkey? That's what Zechariah 9 says. And the answer is, if we're righteous and worthy, he'll come in the clouds of heaven. If we're unrighteous, if we're unworthy, he'll come riding on a donkey. No, it's not either or. The prophet said both. First, he comes riding on a donkey, meek and lowly, to do his priestly work and to suffer and die. And then he will return as king at the end of the age. And here's what's fascinating. Haggai 2 tells us that the glory of the second temple, remember it was destroyed in 70 CE, the glory of the second temple will be greater than the glory of the first temple. God said, I'll fill this place with glory. Study the scriptures when it says fill with glory. It's speaking of his divine presence. And yet that second temple didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, didn't have the Shekinah, the divine presence, didn't have the fire falling. How was the glory of the second temple greater than the glory of the first? And then Malachi 3, it says, Ha'adon, the Lord, he will visit that second temple. And he will purge and purify his people there. How did that happen? And then... Daniel 9 tells us that before the second temple is destroyed, that sin and transgression will reach their full measure and atonement and everlasting righteousness will be brought in. Well, what happened? The temple's been destroyed almost 2,000 years. I can tell you what happened. The Messiah came right on time. There's even Jewish tradition that indicates he should have come 17, 1800 years ago. But it says because of our sins, he didn't know. He came right on schedule, but because of our sins, we missed him. He came and he filled that second temple with glory and he healed the sick and he sent the Ruach, the spirit there. And he visited that divine temple with divine qualities as the prophet said would happen. And he made atonement for our sin and human sin reached its apex by nailing the Messiah to the cross. All this happened. Everything the prophet said happened. The Messiah had to come and begin his mission before the second temple was destroyed. He's the only one that can fulfill the rest of the mission. If he's not our Messiah, we have no Messiah. Now, there is this argument that exists amongst the Jews, and that has to do with the coming of the Messiah, right? Because according to their text, Zechariah and Daniel, there is some level of contradiction in there. And that contradiction as a Christian, I say exists because they do not have the new testament in addition to the old testament now this is the contradiction in daniel 7 13 we are made to understand the coming of the lord in a very judgmental form which is god coming down to judge and then you have zachariah 9 9 which is the coming of the lord as the prince of peace to deliver his people now these two coming of the messiah aren't the same and so it brought a lot of controversy amongst the Jews, which they debated on for years. Now, the end results to those debates was that those two books were not contradicting each other with regards to the coming of the Messiah. This is what they concluded on, right? The Messiah is going to come down based on the lives of the Jews in that time. And so if the Jews are to be living a good life that pleases the Lord, then that means that Messiah would come down as the Prince of Peace described in Zechariah 9.9. And if the time or the coming of the Messiah is dated in a moment where the lives of the Jews do not please God, then he's going to come down as a judge and judge the entire world straight straight up and this is simply because they do not believe that the Messiah has come and gone as Christians believe now from a biblical perspective Zachariah 9 9 is fulfilled in Luke 19 28 and that has to do with the triumphal entry right where jesus christ sits on a coat and rides into jerusalem now that coat over there signified peace and this was the tradition of the day anytime they went for war when kings went for war and wanted peace one the opponent or the side that wanted peace comes sitting on a donkey instead of a horse a horse signified war and then donkeys signified peace and so the side that wants peace sits on a donkey moving towards their opponent on a donkey and that is how their opponents know they have given up and so the war is over and so jesus sits on a donkey 
riding into Jerusalem, which was a prophecy fulfilled from Zechariah 9 9. Now, reading downwards, you come to realize Jesus has been arrested and has been brought before the high priest. In Mark 14 62 63, and the high priest asked Jesus a simple question At thou the Messiah, the Son of Man, blessed be he. Now, the response from Jesus is quite profound and interesting because now he affirms his deity as God right before the high priest and also quotes Daniel 7.13 which spoke concerning his second coming and so now his first coming has been confirmed which was the previous day in Bethphage where he sat on a coach riding into Jerusalem. Now he's been arrested and Jesus is quoting his second coming which is in Daniel 7.13. And so now, from the biblical corpuses, we come to understand that Jesus in the New Testament, which Christians refer to as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, fulfilled the prophecy in Zechariah 9 9. Whilst he sat before the chief priest, he also made mention of a second coming, which is Daniel 7 13. And so we Christians are lying now in wait. For the second coming of jesus christ which is going to be the day of judgment it's so unfortunate that the jews are still waiting for the first coming which they aren't too sure which one is going to be let's pray for people around the world that they would be enlightened with the wisdom of the holy spirit and also come by the knowledge of who the true christ is so that they would be saved not everybody would go to heaven that is the honest truth if you are a jew watching me you should know that your tradition and the law has been purely corrupted because a lot of traditions has been added to it which is in biblical and that alone should uh, alert you some way that there is something going on and that something going on is that jesus the messiah has come and already died the prophecy in Zechariah 9 9 has already been fulfilled. It is not coming to be fulfilled anymore. The second coming is going to be Judgment Day. Salvation has been made today for everyone, such that nobody now would be able to have any excuse to give on Judgment Day. The good news is being preached all the time, and today in our age, because of technology, has been made very easy. Now you do not have any reason not to become born again in fact being born again you don't lose anything it is completely free and i pray that you come by the knowledge of christ and accept christ as your lord and personal savior if you love contents like this kindly don't forget to subscribe like share until my next video peace out